Gareth Neem, we're talking to you today about Bulgravia. Everyone knows you and Julian Fellows for Downton Abbey, and this is another time that you're working together on this limited series, uh, just six episodes, unfortunately, because everyone is so good. Um, and I think what's interesting about this reunion with Julian Fellows is it sort of happened the opposite way to Downton Abbey, right? Didn't Downton Abbey, you go to him with the idea of working together? Yes, correct. Um, Downton Abbey was an original series. Uh, I went to him um, and, and came with the headline idea and said, I want to make an episodic series of, with this setting and this subject, and I'd like to create it. And, and we brainstormed it from there. Um, cut to several years later, he was separately commissioned to write a novel, which became Belgravia. Um, and uh, J Julian said, well, I won't show it to anyone else until you've read it and you decide uh, if it's something you want to do. And, and I, so I read the book and really enjoyed it. It's a very, it's a fun, accessible read with, with brilliantly drawn characters. And it's a really fascinating period of history. And it's in that kind of, it's a very different topic to Downton Abbey and, and dramatically it's certainly different. But it has, um, it, it, it has that, um, fellow Ziana, it has that um, uh, uh, comedy of manners, it has that social observation that he does so brilliantly. And I, and I got to the end of the book and I thought, well, I, I ought to buy this because if I don't buy it and make it, then lots of other people will want to do that. It will get made. Somebody will, will, will serialize this on TV and it better be me. So I went back to Julian and said, yeah, I want to buy the book and I want us to do it, uh, do it as an omitted series. And I think what's interesting is the themes of the two are similar in, in the sense that you Downton, you're seeing it's sort of almost the beginning of the end of the aristocracy, right? I mean, it's and yet and then with Belgravia, we see this rise of the merchant class who I guess you know, some of them become the aristocracy. <laughs> That's That's mine. In fact, in later episodes, um, you, you'll see that the the James Trenchard character, although he's a brilliant man, clearly he's exceptional, he's, he's come from nothing, he's made a fortune, but it's his son, Oliver, who will, will eventually be a gentleman. He's the person who will have the country estate and the money and, and be recognized. This was the way it worked back then. It was very different from the American system, but you were never quite in society if you'd had to make the money yourself. But your children and your grandchildren because they would have been born to the money and they would have had the, the fine education and, 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 and known the right people and been in the right places, they could become the aristocracy. So it's quite likely that James Trenchard's uh, you know, grandchild, great-grandchildren or whatever could, could, you know, after a few generations, that could happen. And you're absolutely right, the setting, the, most of the show, we, we, we start the show in 1815, but we then leap forward to the 1840s and we see this extraordinary new spangled city being built exclusively for rich people in London. And it's still there today. It's, it's almost unchanged. It's a very beautiful part of London that's still highly desirable for people to live in. Um, and we're seeing the old money mixing with the new money. And uh, it's a real melting pot um, uh, of all of that. And, and you're right, the, the aristocracy are still at the height of their powers. The British Empire is growing from strength to strength. Whereas in Downson, we saw really the dying of the light and we saw what happened when it came to an end. Here, this, it's still full of energy and we, in later episodes, we see the Industrial Revolution. We see how fortunes and enterprise, um, uh, fortunes can be made and an enterprise carried out. Um, so it's a uh, really fascinating uh, place and time. And then, you know, as the producer, I mean, you're the sort of... In charge of the overall production and you you talk about belgravia is still there but there's enough changes in belgravia that couldn't be the place that you filmed when you were doing location shooting so if if people watching want to go to this belgravia where do they have to go in the united kingdom well it was um i think very brilliantly put together it's quite impossible to film something of this scale in belgravia um it it would be uh it would be like you know, shutting down the Upper East Side for two weeks and trying to uh, put horses and carriages in there. And it, it, it's it's full of embassies. It's very high security. Um, couldn't do it. 
uh, but it's unique. And I guess if this was a show that was going to run for multiple years, you could build a back lot at vast expense. But that wasn't an option for a limited show. So in the end, what we did is we filmed in the city of Edinburgh, in the new town of Edinburgh, which is of a similar era, um, a, a little, it's a bit earlier actually, but, but it's all Georgian architecture. Um, and the great thing about shooting in Edinburgh, it was much quieter and this particular square that we filmed in still has cobblestones and wrought iron uh, railings and it was completely controllable. We could shut it down. But the problem is the streets of Belgra Belgravia are uh, covered in a white render across all of the buildings. It makes them look almost like a wedding cake. The building's like a wedding cake. It's very iconic look. And that's a totally different style to um, Edinburgh. So the great thing about this wonderful age that we're in from a technological point of view is that we could add all of that render onto the building in post. And the buildings all have um, porticos on the front of them, which don't exist there in Edinburgh. So again, that was all added uh, via visual effects. And it's a really great, great uh, symmetry between excellent art direction uh, on the floor combined with the skills of our VFX team to pull it all together, and and uh, it works incredibly well. Well, the, your art production team—that's the the people from Downton. Those the, these Emmy-winning artisans. Um, but for the director, uh, you go to John Alexander, who I don't. Did he work on Downton at all? No, he did not. Yeah. Um, but John Alexander worked with us. Uh, well, a few productions, but most recently. He was the initial director on uh, Jamestown, a series that we made uh, that's on uh, PBS. Um, we have a great relationship with him. But a lot of the departments uh, did come from Downton Abbey. So, yes, yeah, certainly the art department, uh, Donald Woods and his Emmy Award winning team, uh, the same composer, John Lunn, who was Emmy Award winning uh, for Downton. Um, so, yeah, I think it's always good to work with some of your you know, really close partners that you work with on, on a frequent basis, but it's also good to bring in new people and so that, so that it's not just the same every time. You have some some new, some new incomers and some new blood to, to the whole process. Well, and then in terms of the casting, uh, you know, we all fell in love with Maggie Smith in Downton, if we didn't already love her. And you've got another dame, Harriet Walter, in this wonderful role, you know, the, the countess that sort of manipulating people and then it, uh, you realize it's really from her heart um, and, but I, the, and that casting is just so spot on but I have to admit when I read about Tams and Grieg being cast I was like everyone knows her from episodes from Green Wing comic uh, talk about that casting because she's so wonderful at this quiet reserved performance uh, and it's just it's really something to watch well, I think it's often very nice to um, be a bit unpredictable with casting. And Tamsin Gregg, who is best known to US audiences from episodes, and she's very known actually on, on television in the UK as a, as a comedic actress. But I've followed her for years and years. In fact, I went to university with her. We were, we were contemporaries at, at, at college. Um, and we both, you know, I became a producer and she became an actress, but we've never worked with, e with each other professionally in the following 35 years or whatever it is. This is the first time that we work together. She has an excellent reputation as a stage actress in, in London. Uh, and her reviews are fantastic. And, and um, I really felt that, that, that this, is, this could be the time for her to be recognized for the great drama actress that she is, as well as being a great comedy. And I think there's a wonderful juxtaposition, uh, contrast between um, between her performance and Harriet Walters, because the, these two the women are at the heart of the show. And, and, and as with Downton, you know, it's a great show for women. Women uh, are, in, uh, are driving very much of the story. And at, at its heart, this show, and there are many, many different themes about it, but the center of it are these two women who are from completely different walks of life. One is born to it. She talks about how she was painted by the finest portrait painters when she was a young woman. She's married into one of the great families of the, the, the country. 
and her opposite number is this woman who's married to a man who started off as a as a market trader and has now made made money nobody doubts he he's brilliant and enterprising but he he doesn't have the social graces uh so anyway she's she's a new upwardly mobile middle class um but they are united these two women who have really nothing in common other than the fact that they have both lost their and they and at the heart of the story for me is the love that a mother has for her child and the grief when you leave it when uh, you know for people who tragically lose children know that that is something that can never leave and it's a part of you forever and i love the fact that these two otherwise very contrasting women ha are connected by this bond and of course uh, they discover that they have a shared grandson and that they will stop at nothing to um, help their grandson get on in his life. Well, I think one reason that people just adore Downton Abbey, I think, was the that sense of place and time and, and the accuracy. And what I love about Belgravia is we get this, the same with that. And I particularly love the, the scene um, where uh, the two women sort of come together for the first time. And it's based on this historical uh, event uh, at, the, at the Duchess of Bedford. So, and I loved, I just loved learning what I learned in that scene, not just about the characters, but about history. Yeah, well, I totally agree with you. This is, this is pure, this is, you know, Fellows at his best, that he, uh, he finds a unique moment in history and, and places a scene there. You know, to American audiences, everyone knows about the tradition you know, tea drinking and the tradition of afternoon tea. But what I love about what we've done with that scene is we've, we've, we're teasing the audience and saying, well, the afternoon tea, it, 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 you know, it wasn't there for all time. Like everything else on this world, it had to be invented by somebody. And uh, this came about because, you know, we think that our meal times are set in stone because we, we have breakfast, lunch and dinner and, and we, we know what time we have those meals. But in fact, you know, in days gone by, before there was electric lighting and, you know, all that sort of thing, um, you know, the world wasn't regulated in the same way. And mealtimes kept changing through the 18th and early 19th centuries. You know, the time that you had lunch uh, got, you know, was earlier. The time that people had their evening meal went later. And so people got hungry um, in the middle part of the day and that they needed a light meal to take them through between lunch and, and their evening meal and and this was it's a true event that it was the Duchess of Bedford who said I can have a social gathering in the afternoons and serve tea and 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 finger food and it means you don't need to be stuck next to somebody at a table who you might get bored with but you can mingle around the room and move from person to person and of course those kind of uh, informal cocktail parties or tea parties or whatever you might want to call it are, are things that we still do to this day you know, you mentioned uh, Harriet and Tamsin, and I must mention Alice Eve as well, because it's a, an extraordinary performance. I mean, in the first scene of, with her at the dinner table, so much is said, we learn so much with no dialogue, the looks and everything. But just, it's so refreshing to see this woman that we know sort of from much more sort of uh, take charge roles, to see her in this role, um, just about, if you could just talk about the casting of her, because it was really uh, an eye opener to me about the, uh, her extraordinary talent. Well, uh, it's uh, Susan Trenchard is is a great character, and you're right in that opening scene. She's annoyed that uh, she wasn't invited to the party, and 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 uh, uh, Anne Trenchard says to her, "Well, I can't take you to meet a, a woman I I barely know." She answers, "A duchess you barely know." Uh, you know, everything is pointed. Everything has some some grit and some tub, subtext. Um, she is a great character, and and uh, you know, very driven. Um, and uh, again, you know, Alice is somebody I work with um, when I think she first graduated a um, long time ago now, and I've never worked with her since. But I'm absolutely thrilled with what she gave us um, in in the show. She she's really one of the uh, juiciest, most enjoyable characters in the, in the whole piece. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and the chemistry with Adam James, who, who's wonderful as well. I mean, he could take what could be a sort of a one-dimensional villain, and he, again, 
embodies this. But I, I've got to ask you about that force of nature that's Philip Glenster. I mean, he's extraordinary. Uh, just and and again, I think American audiences may not know him, but he's a big, big star in uh, English television. Um, did he have any reservations about sort of this period? I know he's done period, but you know the '70s and the '80s, uh, the 1900s. Did he, did he have any reservations about doing this kind of a period piece? Well, I've heard I've heard Philip say that he he seems to be offered a period piece every few years, and he likes to, he likes to do it. Um, and you're right, he's he's extremely well known on British television, not so well known in the US. So he so looking at it from a, a perspective. Uh, in the UK, you know, he, he comes with uh, a, a big track record, but it's actually wonderful for um, domestic to find out about him because he's so great in the show. He's one of the best things about it. And I think he really captures uh, this sense of a man who is unsophisticated and doesn't fit in and he wasn't born to any of this. And he he, he makes all of these social uh, uh, faux pas, which, which are, of course, highly amusing and are central to a lot of the comedic writing. Uh, of fellows, um, but there's no escaping the fact he's clearly a brilliant man. He's he's told early on in in the first episode, the Duke of Wellington tells him he's going to go far, um, and you know we we uh, the, the story jumps on uh, about twenty years later, or so, and we discover he has done exactly that. He's become a brilliant um, um, entrepreneur and businessman and and and, and developer, and has made a fortune for, for him and his family. And I think. I think Philip really captures that, um, a man, you know, who wants to do the right thing by his grandson, by his family, but, you know, oftentimes makes mistakes in, in the right way of uh, going about that. And I think he's pitched his performance absolutely in the right way, captured the character, what you think from the, the fact that, you, you know, you read the book originally, whether you think that that was sort of pretty much how you had seen um, uh, the Trenchard character. Oh, absolutely. But, and I think but the energy, I mean, just when he, he's sort of almost electric when he's in these scenes, like the when the glass breaks, you know, in that one pivotal moment. Um, you know, you're the producer of this and as I said, sort of in charge of the overall production. I love this book. Um, were there scenes that you just had to say, I'm so, we can't go there. We can't afford that for this. Uh, I'm thinking of one in particular that uh, was sort of missing. Oh, you're going to have to tell me what that scene is because I can't remember now. Um, oh, are you talking about the building of um, Nelson's Column? Yes, yes. Yeah. Which I, I give you give a little shout out to in the opening credits, which I love. Well spotted. So you're quite right. So uh, great scene in the book. Two characters are walking across Trafalgar Square in central London. And uh, and then after you know, or a character arrives having walked past it and, and says, "Oh, I saw." I, th uh, uh, um, uh, I, I think it's John. I think it's the John Bellis's character, isn't it? When he's when he's with Susan Trenchard in the novel, he, and he uh, or she says to him about the building of the new Nelson's Column. Well, again, it's a nice bit of fun for the audience because anyone who visits London, one of the first sites that you see will be Nelson's Column. This is talking about a time when it was still under construction. We did put it in the script. I remember saying to Julian, let's have it in the script and we'll do it if I think we can do it. And for some reason or other, we decided that that was maybe an expense too far. So we, yes, we took the idea and we put it in the title sequence to show that it was part, because I love the idea of, um, you know, James Trenchard is a, is a property developer and you see in the whole title sequence, you see Belgravia grows from these architectural drawings into the city that it becomes. And uh, and we see other parts of London that, that are being built, uh, places that, that still exist today, which were in their infancy. So, I lo yeah, I love that we get, as you say, well spotted. We, we had a nod to it in the, in the titles. Well, it just sort of, to me, was bracketing the sort of Napoleonic Wars, you know, from Trafalgar to Waterloo. And that's sort of the beginning of the novel. Um, I, I know the novel ended it, that, it, as this limited series did, but it's one of I just is there a potential for another series, another season? I mean, he's, uh, I know Julian's so busy, but this story just has so much more to be told, I feel. Well, I don't think this story has more to be told in, the, in that it's, uh, it's an adaptation of a novel. It is definitely a limited uh, series, and so there's, n there's no plan to do, uh, to do more. And, um, you know, we, we hope uh, 
Academy members will consider it on, on its uh, merits. That said, uh, you know, in this business, never say never. I, I suspect one day in about 30 years' time, somebody's going to um, pull this IP out of, a, out of a cupboard and discover something called Downs Abbey and say, oh, well, that, used, that was really big 50 years ago. Let's remake it. I mean, who knows what might happen? Never right. say but, oh, um, but yeah. Setting of Belgravia would be a great place to do other stories, but that is not, um, you know, that's not a, a, the moment we, um, we, uh, Julian and I are, uh, are going on, obviously, to make this uh, HBO series, The Gilded Age, which is sort of right. like everyone in the world is, um, is shut down right now, which is why I've grown this shaggy beard, because uh, I'm back here in London, um, and we hope we'll make another Downson movie. Um, so we, we've got other things in the pipeline, and at the moment, um, this is it for Belgravia, and, and we, we hope the Academy members will, will you know, love this story. And, and, you know, it's great that people want more. That's obviously exactly the outcome that we're looking for. But at the moment, we can't give them more. That's not the plan. I, I misspoke. I, the story is told completely. I meant the characters just, I want to know what happens to those characters. And that, and that to me, is the mark of something so well made that you, even at the, after the last scene, you're like, but what next? What next for each of them? So it's... Uh, yeah. Well, I think it, that is a tribute to um, the great characters that he... Uh, drew in the book, and uh, they've just been so well delivered by by all of our cast. Uh, I think mm -hmm. also, you know, Tom Wilkinson. How fantastic to have him! Absolutely. You know, in 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 that role, it's just a it's a a, a brilliant. I mean, we're very lucky in these. these oh, well, I mean, very lucky in that we have such great actors um, who are so good in these period shows. Oh yeah, James Fleet and the newcomers. I mean, it's just it's so beautifully cast right the way through. But the only what just gave me pause was when I heard you then say another Downton movie. So if that's the consolation prize for having having to wait for Belgravia season two, um, that's not a bad consolation prize. Well, listen, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, and really congratulations on Belgravia. Thanks for your the nice comments. I'm really glad you enjoyed it.